Well, thank you, Brad. And let me thank you and Dr. Fields and the team at uh, 4-H uh, for allowing us to use your platform for this occasion. And to all of you who are joining us uh, for this virtual town hall, you know, this is the time of year that normally we have students visiting uh, us on Capitol Hill. And I always enjoy uh, giving people a tour and talking to them on the steps of the Capitol. Uh, but because we were not able to do that this year, uh, we thought it would be a great idea uh, if we could all meet online and virtually. And happy to try and answer the questions that you may have today. Uh, before we get to that, I do want to thank all the organizations uh, that have helped bring us together today. I mentioned uh, the 4-H. We also have the Boys and Girls Club. Thank you all very much. Uh, Jack and Jill, uh, who I also meet with frequently on Capitol Hill, uh, but it's good to meet with you here virtually. Uh, and then other after-school programs uh, in the Maryland Out of School Time Network uh, and the mentoring programs with Maryland Mentor. Uh, so thank you to all our partners uh, who are bringing us together right now. And to all the students uh, who are tuning in, uh, I recognize uh, that it's been a long time uh, that you've been out of school uh, and that you're not able to go to many places you normally visit, including the field trips uh, like to Capitol Hill. Uh, it's also changed a lot of things uh, for myself and the others um, in Congress. Uh, so I represent you in the United States Senate. There are two uh, senators from Maryland and two from every state. And we've also been doing a lot of our work uh, virtually uh, by different kinds of um, social media networks. Uh, we in the United States Senate did go back into session recently. In fact, I voted earlier today uh, on the floor of the Senate. Uh, we're all trying to make sure, we are making sure that we respect all the social distancing requirements. Uh, so for example, when I'm on the Senate, uh, I wear this uh, face mask. You may see that it's an Orioles um, face mask. Uh, if there are any national fans out there, and I'm a national fan too, please uh, tell me where I can get one for the nationals. Um, we want to make sure that we uh, support all the Maryland teams. Uh, but in addition to voting and making sure we're careful uh, in that respect, uh, we've started having hearings. So I serve on the banking committee. We had a hearing the other day, but we, we mostly participated the way we're all participating right now. Uh, we had witnesses um, to answer questions about different issues, uh, but we asked them uh, questions online. So we're changing uh, the way we do business uh, and need to make sure that as we work to reopen, um, we will do it in a safe, uh, safe way. Uh, and that's really important. And I want to thank all of you, all the students uh, who have helped us in our community and state uh, keep others safe. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce to you a special guest uh, who's also going to be here to answer any questions you have. And that's uh, Dr. Wen, Dr. Lena Wen, uh, who is a real healthcare expert. Um, she was the head of, you know, the Baltimore City Health Department. She was the health commissioner there. Uh, she's uh, taught um, in many different places. Uh, she's the associate professor of emergency medicine at George Washington. University. Um, for those of you uh, who watch CNN, uh, she's been there many, many days. Uh, she also recently appeared on Sesame Street uh, to ask, answer questions from a younger uh, group. Um, my wife, Catherine, and I have three children. Our children are older. Dr. Wen has two much younger children, including a daughter, Isabel, who was just born uh, about a month ago. So with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Wen for a few opening comments, and then we really want to get to your questions. Dr. Wen. Thank you very much, Senator, and thank you for your great leadership. I admire you very much. My entire family does, um, and I'm glad to be joining you all. Um, I'm looking forward to answering your questions, um, but just wanted to say also, in addition to having this baby, um, baby girl who's a month old, as the Senator said, I also have a two and a half year old son named Eli, who might make a surprise appearance during this town hall. Um, I'm actually in his room right now, and so he might 
come bursting in at any moment. Um, but I think that right now with um, coronavirus, this new coronavirus, there is a lot that's unknown, a lot that we're going through together. And um, if it's any message I want to for everyone to have, it's that everything we are doing to keep ourselves safe, it also keeps our family members safe and it protects everybody else around us. This is really a case where we're in this together. So I'm gonna turn it back over to the Senator. Well, thank you, Dr. Wen. And let me just turn it right over to um, anyone on this call who has questions. This town hall is really for all of you. Again, thanks for, thanks for tuning in with us and we're available to try and answer any questions you have on, on any issue, the coronavirus, you know, what's happening on Capitol Hill, uh, Dr. Wen's um, work uh, in Maryland around the country, whatever you want to ask. Great. Thank you, Senator and Dr. Wen. Uh, we have had over 100 questions that have come in already, and I'm happy to share those with you. This is Dr. Nia Fields with the University of Maryland Extension with 4-H. And the first question is from James, who's 10, and he asks, why is COVID-19 keeping us from school? Well, I'll give a brief answer and then turn it over to uh, Dr. Wen. Uh, the reason is because we want to slow down and then stop uh, the infection. And the way the coronavirus works is it jumps from person to person. And what happens is if somebody has the coronavirus, they can, of course, they can infect other people, like two or three people. And then those two or three people can have the virus jump from them to others. Uh, and that's why it's really important that we engage in social distancing. And while the good news of this virus um, is that for the most part, um, it, it doesn't um, have a harmful impact on younger people. Number one, there are some exceptions to that. Uh, and number two, younger people can still carry it and transmit it uh, to other people. And that's why it's so important that we stop this virus by practicing social distancing, staying far enough away from each other so it can't jump uh, from one of you to another. And that's why it's also so important that you wash your hands so that you don't pick it up from doorknobs and other things. But let me turn it over to, to Dr. Wen uh, because uh, this is her specialty. Thank you, Senator. And it's a great question about school. Um, I'm sure everybody is wondering about this now. So this new coronavirus is part of a family of coronaviruses. And some of these other coronaviruses we all know about because they cause the common cold. And so think about the cold or the flu where you get it. If you're sneezing, you're coughing, you then sneeze and cough into your hand and then you touch something and then somebody else touches that. Or you sneeze and cough and those droplets land onto someone else. That's why, I'm, um, based on what the Senator was saying, that's how that virus then jumps from one person to another. So the best way to stop that spread is to keep people apart from each other. And you can imagine if you pick something up from a student at school, if you get a cold from someone at school, even if you're not that sick yourself, you could come home and, um, and spread that germ to someone else, to your parents, to your grandparents, who could get very ill. And so that's why we're all staying at home for now. That's why we're not seeing our friends, we're not going to camp, we're not going to these things that we really enjoy, but we're doing that because we want to stay safe and again, protect everybody else too. Thank you, Senator and Dr. Wen. The next question uh, came from Peyton and uh, Dylan, and they both wanna know, uh, is there an estimate date on a vaccine being released? Well, I will definitely turn this over uh, to Dr. Wen, just with making this statement that very early on um, after the outbreak of this coronavirus, uh, one of my first stops uh, was over at NIH, the National Institutes of Health, uh, which is a great national, in fact, internationally uh, renowned uh, center for uh, healthcare research, for medical research. Uh, it's right here in our state of Maryland, uh, as is the Food and Drug Administration, uh, which also reviews applications for people who are developing uh, drugs and vaccines uh, to determine whether or not they're safe and whether they're able to accomplish what they say they're going to accomplish in terms of uh, stopping the spread of a, a disease or reducing uh, the, the symptoms. Uh, now, According to Dr. Fauci, uh, who uh, you may also have uh, seen uh, on TV, 
Uh, he's part of the president's task force. Uh, this will take up to 12 to 18 months. Some people think that that may be able to be accelerated, but let me turn it over to Dr. Wen. Uh, again, this is her part of her specialty. I mean, I agree with you, um, Senator. I think the um, the best estimates that we've seen for how long this might take, if all things go well, it could be 12 to 18 months, which is a long time. But know that we have the best scientists, the best doctors all around the world who are working on this because vaccine is what will prevent us from getting coronavirus. In the meantime, what works to prevent us from getting coronavirus it sounds very basic, but it is those things that we talked about before. It is washing your hands really well, singing happy birthday um, while you uh, twice while you wash your hands or seeing your entire ABCs while washing your hands because that's the 20 seconds it takes. Also, if you're sick, if you're sneezing, if you're coughing, don't go to don't go in the public to be around other people. Um, and doing your best to stay away from others in the meantime. And I know that's really hard, especially with the nice weather, but you can still go outside and enjoy the weather, but just not outside, but not with other people who are not in your, in your household. Great, thank you. The next question comes from Aurora and she asks, is Congress helping protect nurses, volunteers, and high-risk individuals? So this, this is a very important issue, and Congress is uh, doing everything it can to provide uh, that protection. Um, we have now passed four major pieces of legislation, laws. Uh, we've done it in a relatively fast time, certainly fast for Congress, and we've done it uh, so far on a bipartisan basis. Uh, and in, in that legislation, uh, there are provisions to provide a surge of resources, of dollars, uh, to nurses and doctors on the front line. So uh, hospitals will receive those funds to help them treat patients uh, with COVID-19. Community health centers, uh, which are really important because they're accessible uh, to people uh, in every part of the state. Uh, nursing homes and senior living facilities, we know that uh, those institutions have been especially uh, hard hit. So we're providing resources. But all that being said, um, we're facing a huge national shortage of what's called personal protective equipment. Uh, that's the, those are the masks. And if you're working in a hospital, you need a mask that's uh, much better than that one. Um, you need a N95 mask because you want to make sure that those uh, droplets that Dr. Wen talked about um, cannot uh, get through it easily. Uh, and when it comes to that personal protective equipment, masks, gowns, gloves. Uh, we've seen major shortages uh, throughout the country. And that's why many of us are pressing and have introduced proposed laws right now to really get the, the executive branch, the president, to fully use what's called the Defense Production Act. This is a law that's in existence uh, where the federal government in times of emergency can direct a companies to produce things that are badly needed at this moment. And so we want them to use that law to ask more companies to produce the masks, the gowns, the gloves to protect people and the testing that we're gonna really need to safely reopen because we wanna make sure that if the virus begins to creep back, that we can find it quickly and that we can find that person and talk to all the people that person's been in contact with so that we can stop it from becoming a raging fire. Uh, we wanna be able to detect it and put it out uh, very, very quickly. Uh, so we've been trying to provide those uh, protective uh, equipment uh, to nurses and doctors. Uh, Dr. Wen, of course, um, has, has, has worked um, in the, on the front line, so let me also ask her to respond. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for all of you who are watching, who know someone um, who is a healthcare worker, a doctor, a nurse, a respiratory therapist, a technician, I mean, and, and not just healthcare workers, there are so many people who have to go to work right now, um, who work in public transportation, on buses, who work in grocery stores, they are really the heroes. 
um, because they go to work to protect the, the rest of us. And so I really appreciate the Senator's efforts to also protect our essential workers because that's our obligation. Our essential workers are, are helping everybody else stay safe. And so I really appreciate, Senator, your making sure that we also help our frontline heroes. Great. Well, thank, thank you. you, Dr. Wen, for mentioning that. And I, I just want to say, I, I mentioned earlier that the United States Senate has resumed some of its business. Um, I, I will say that I've been very concerned that in the process, all the other workers who have to come back to Capitol Hill uh, could be exposed. And I'm most worried about the workers Dr. Wen's talking about, those who are on the front lines and for whom it's harder to make sure that we protect them through social distancing. So if you're a cafeteria worker, uh, for example, or if you are, you know, driving uh, the House or Senate subway, or if you're one of the janitorial service workers, uh, those are the individuals I really worry about. And that's in the Senate, as Dr. Wen said, um, those are the people who, in addition to nurses and doctors, are really out there every day. And we need to make sure that they have the protection. Great, thank you, uh, Senator and Dr. Wen. I'm going to merge these two questions together from Jenea and Cameron. They wanna know, will kids have to go back a grade when they go back to school? And will schools reopen uh, once the vaccine uh, is administered? So I certainly hope that uh, students won't have to go back a grade. I, I don't think that that's going to happen. Uh, but I think all of you, you know, recognize that we've now lost uh, many months um, of important time in school. And I think people probably heard that today, you know, the governor indicated uh, that uh, Maryland would not, or yesterday re indicated we were not going to be reopening uh, schools for the remainder of this uh, school year, and we'll have to wait and see uh, about reopening schools uh, next year. I certainly hope we're in a position uh, to do that uh, in a safe manner, but that will depend uh, on a lot of the actions that we take uh, between now and then. In the meantime, um, there are two things we need to be doing. One is to make sure that all students uh, can have access to the to online education uh, and long before this pandemic hit I'd introduced legislation in the United States Senate uh, to close what we call the homework gap in this country uh, you're all students um, you know that uh, when teachers assign homework I don't know what we have a we have students from different grades on here but um, at least in 70 percent of the cases students really need to be able to go on the internet uh, to do the research to get the answers to homework questions. And so students who don't have access to computers, or maybe they have computers, but they're not, they're not hooked up, they don't have that internet connection, high-speed internet connection, or uh, they maybe have access to an internet connection, but the costs of the data plan are, are too high and unaffordable. We, need, we needed to address this before the pandemic, um, we need to do it um, on a super urgent basis now. So we were able to get some monies in the, in the bills that we passed recently to go to school systems to help with exactly this process, linking up uh, every single student, uh, because otherwise it's simply unfair. Uh, it's what we call the homework gap, the digital divide. It's unfair to students uh, who don't have that link. Um, and we need to make sure we address that. But there is no substitute to actually having all of you back in the classroom. That is obviously the best case scenario. Uh, and that we'll have, to, uh, we'll have to see on how successful we are at really defeating uh, this virus and slowing it down and then make the decisions based on what's uh, best and, and most safe. But that, so let me, Dr. Wen, you, I don't know if you want to comment on that or not. Um. I mean, only to say that there is a lot of uncertainty right now. Um, we don't know right exactly when we're going to go back to school. Um, I would say also we don't know what school is going to look like when we do go back. It may be that there are going to be some changes. It may be that we don't have assemblies. Um, it may be that the desks are now further apart. 
or that even um, the school day may look different with certain grades going at certain times. We don't know that yet. Um, I don't think though that we're going to wait until we have a vaccine before going back to school. That we're not going to wait you know, two years or a year and a half before going back to school, but it will look different, I think, when, when we do go back. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Gabrielle, and she's asking if someone is considering a career in public service, what advice would you give? Well, both Dr. Wen and I have had the privilege of uh, serving, and I'm glad that there's uh, interest uh, in, in doing that. I encourage um, everybody um, who has that inclination uh, to pursue public service. I, I think the first thing is just to make sure you pursue your, your passions in whatever direction they take you in terms of public service. And one way uh, to really get a sense of you know, what you want to do is to uh, work to volunteer uh, for an organization that may be of interest to you. So in a volunteer organization helping people who are homeless. Uh, you know, right now, there are a lot of people who are going hungry. Food assistance is really important. So we do have a lot of volunteers right now, again, practicing social distancing, as Dr. Wen said, uh, protecting the Chesapeake Bay and the environment. So what I'm saying is that there are different things that you can do in the area of volunteering in public service sectors um, that uh, may give you a sense of exactly uh, what you want to do. And then there are, of course, so many different ways to, to serve. Um, uh, you can serve in the healthcare area, and you know we see a lot of people on the front lines now. Dr. Wen headed up the Baltimore City um, Health Department. Uh, you can serve in elective office, um, and uh, that's an opportunity to work to try to pass laws uh, that you think can help uh, lots of people, um, whether it's uh, trying to make sure everybody has access uh, to, to healthcare, coverage and affordable access, or whether it's protecting the Chesapeake Bay or trying to address climate change, um, whatever it may be, that's another avenue through elective office or working uh, for state and local governments. Um, there are so many different things you can do in the, in the government sector, in the nonprofit sector. So uh, I would just encourage all of you when it comes to Capitol Hill, when you're uh, when you're depending on you know, what grade you're in or whether you're in college, there are internship programs uh, that you can apply for to see if uh, you, that's something you're interested in. Um, we have a, we have an internship program for college students from Maryland uh, in the summer. Unfortunately, this year, uh, because of the coronavirus, we've had to uh, cancel at least the first half of that program. We're, we're going to wait and see whether we can do the second half. But those are some of the things that you can pursue to get a sense of, you know, what your, what your interests are and uh, what you want to do. Dr. Wen? Um, only to add that uh, there are so many things you can do to make a difference. So don't wait for the perfect opportunity. I think a lot of young people have a dream to do something, which is fantastic, and you should hold on to that dream. Um, but don't wait until you have that exact right thing um, to make a difference. You all have been sending in some awesome questions. We appreciate them. Keep them coming. We'll try to get to as many as possible. Uh, the next question is from Riley. How will the government use this epidemic to learn about the flaws in our healthcare system and our preparedness for other epidemics? How can we evolve from the COVID-19? Well, my goodness, lots of really good uh, questions. And I really do hope uh, that we will learn uh, from this experience, uh, because it's pretty clear uh, that uh, we both let down our defenses, um, and in some cases, that was done through, you know, I think decisions that when we when we look through all of this, we'll realize that we made many mistakes. Uh, I think it's clear that the coronavirus got a six to eight week head start here in the United States after we knew that it was already here. Uh, we should have taken much faster action uh, to put in place the things Dr. Wen's talking about for social distancing, to, to stop that rapid early uh, spread. Uh, but we also need to make sure that we keep our early warning systems up 
Uh, we have an organization called the Centers for Disease Control. It's a federal uh, institution. Um, it's based in Atlanta, Georgia. They have people uh, overseas uh, trying to monitor outbreaks. Uh, and in this case, um, some of them did provide early warning. In other cases, those positions, unfortunately, uh, had been essentially withdrawn. And so we did not have our full contingent of people on the front lines. Uh, and then we've also learned that we need to have adequate national stockpiles of uh, key equipment and be ready to move quickly uh, when it comes to uh, supplying our healthcare system, our nurses and doctors um, and other frontline workers with what they need. And we also need to recognize that there will be another uh, pandemic like this, uh, but, and we need, we need to make sure that we are, are better prepared. So. Uh, when we finish addressing this emergency, there will be, I hope, a national effort, uh, a, a sort of blue ribbon commission, some people get together, the scientists and others uh, who are really experts in this area, and figure out um, what went wrong um, and how we can do better next time. Dr. Wen? You know, there's a saying in public health that public health saved your life today, you just don't know it. And it's because so much of the work that we do in public health and in preparing in general, um, it's behind the scenes because you don't see what happens when you prevent something from happening, right? You don't see what could have happened if only you didn't do this. <laughs> so that's why um, I think public health tends to be, it tends to not get the funding and the recognition that it really needs until something bad happens. And that's again why I really appreciate the Senator's leadership in this, um, in raising the awareness of public health, not only when there's a crisis, but also in preventing something from happening, from something um, from, from happening in the first place. I mean, this time we're doing our best in this current crisis, but I really like the question that it's not just about responding now, it's also about preparing for um, for the future. Great, thank you. And as parents, you might have inter an interesting perspective on this, but Zoe asks, what's the most outrageous misconceptions about COVID-19 you've had to correct with your own kids? Well, um, mine are now, my, my kids are, are older now, uh, you know, they're between the ages of 25 and 30. So we haven't had um, too many outrageous theories coming from them. Uh, but I'm really glad you asked this question because uh, this pandemic really shows why it's so important that, first of all, we have healthcare experts like Dr. Wen, but secondly, why it's so important that we listen to them. And this is a, a healthcare challenge. Um, it's not, should not become a, a political challenge. And, and that is why uh, whenever I'm asked a question uh, about uh, what needs to come next on the healthcare front, I really look to those public health experts. And what's happened, um, at least at some points in the time here in some places, is that you get conflicting information. You get people providing political information instead of healthcare information. And so, that's why it's important that we listen to the doctors like Dr. Wen, like Dr. Fauci, um, who's the you know, point person um, at NIH on infectious diseases and other experts, uh, because this is not a time uh, to follow sort of rumors or you know, crazy theories. This is a time to make sure we listen to the scientists and the healthcare experts like Dr. Wen. And uh, I'm sure she, she's probably had to be out there uh, fighting against some of these uh, crazier theories that have been out there with respect to the coronavirus. Dr. Webb? Yeah, I mean, my kids are too little to express um, to express some myths themselves, although my two and a half year old, the constant struggle is to get him to wash his hands, um, which is very important for everyone to, to, uh, to, to do. But um, no, I, I think that um, the one misconception that I think is, um, is really important for all of us to correct is about who gets a virus and, um, and what and, and who does not get the virus. 
all of us are at risk for getting this coronavirus, just like all of us get could get the cold, all of us could get the flu. In fact, we all do get the cold and the flu at some time, some point in our lives, right? I mean, this is something that we know happens to everyone. So it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what language you speak or where you come from or where your parents come from. This is, this is not something that we should point to one group of people um, and shame or, um, or, or put stigma um, or fear on one group of people. And I think that's really important for all of us. If we see um, other people making these types of comments, we should also correct them and say, this is a virus that is spreading around the world. And it's all of us who could be at risk, but it's also all of us who can fight it together. Great. In that same vein, there's a question from Riley who asks, uh, what do you think about how COVID-19 is affecting minority communities? Well, we've seen uh, a real dis a disparate impact on minority communities, communities of color, uh, especially the African-American community. As, as Dr. Wen indicated, anybody can get this, but uh, communities of color have been more exposed for a number of reasons. Um, in many cases, um, they are more frequently working on the front lines. Um, so many workers are not able to uh, telecommute uh, and do their jobs online. And in many cases, um, you have minority workers disproportionately on the front lines and therefore more exposed. And then there are other you know, weaknesses we have in our healthcare system um, that existed before this coronavirus. Dr. Wen and I and others have been fighting to try and reduce these healthcare uh, disparities uh, and um, we need to work even harder uh, going forward uh, with respect to them because uh, while anybody can can get the coronavirus, uh, you know those who have other kinds of um, uh, conditions are going to be more vulnerable. Uh, so if you have heart disease or high blood pressure or diabetes, um, then you're going to be more vulnerable. And because of the pre-existing disparities in our healthcare system. Uh, you also find um, communities of color having those kinds of conditions in disproportionate uh, numbers. And so um, while, as Dr. Wen said, this virus can hit everybody, some people are more exposed than others, and some people are more vulnerable in the sense that they have pre-existing health conditions. And so this is uh, another question earlier was, how do we deal with some of these, um, these disparities? And, and we really need to close the gaps in our healthcare system, both in terms of frontline healthcare, health insurance coverage, the cost of it, cost of drugs. There are lots of urgent issues that, that predated uh, the pandemic, uh, but the pandemic has just shown why it's important to tackle them right away. Uh, Dr. Wen? You said it so well, um, Senator. Um, you know, in medicine, we call this acute on chronic. That the cr there are chronic issues that are longstanding, that have been there before, and that includes the longstanding health disparities that already are there. But then you add on top of that an acute issue, this new issue that we have of, of coronavirus, and that's making these chronic issues even worse. And so we need to address the issues that, that are here right now. But I do hope that we'll also look at these long-standing disparities um, that unfortunately um, plague uh, our communities and communities around the country. So thank you for your attention to this. Great, thank you. And I do want to recognize that Dr. Wen has to leave us shortly. So I wanted to give her a moment to make any final remarks and then I'll share our final question uh, before we share additional resources at the end. So Dr. Wen, did you have any remarks you wanted to close out with? Sure. So just to reiterate about um, coronavirus, that this is a new disease. And so there's a lot that we do not yet know about it. But there is a lot that we are beginning to find out about it, too. And what we do know is because it is something that's spread from person to person, there's something that we can each do to protect ourselves and our loved ones. So just talking about these things quickly again, make sure to wash your hands frequently um, for 20 seconds, seeing your ABCs while you do that. 
don't go out if you're sick tell your parents um if the moment that you're that you're not feeling well so that you can get the care so that you can get good care if you're going to be sneezing it's always a good idea to sneeze into your elbow um or into your into a tissue and then throw away the tissue don't just sneeze into the air you wouldn't want somebody to sneeze on you and so do the same thing for other people and then remember that the reason why we are staying apart from others for now is so that we're protecting not just ourselves we're protecting our friends our family members our loved ones and we're also keeping everybody in our community safe as well i know we're all making big sacrifices and it's really you know the, it's the weather's getting nice you want to see your friends you want to go back to school but just know that all of this is to protect everyone because we are all in this together. so thank you again senator for inviting me to be part of your town hall Dr. Wen, thank you for joining us. And most importantly, thank you for all you're doing to try to protect uh, the public health. And as you said, everybody. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Wen. So we have time for one final question and then our community partners are gonna share some resources towards the end. Uh, but Noah and uh, a man have similar questions. They wanna know how long is social distancing going to last and why can't they play with their friends as they normally do if they know they aren't sick? Well, this is a, a question on all of our minds. How long will social distancing have to last? And that will depend on the recommendations. In my view, it should depend on the recommendations of the healthcare experts, uh, people like Dr. Wen and other experts, the scientists, uh, who have the best sense of how this is all, uh, how it's spreading and how fast it's spreading. But here's the, the indicators that we've sort of, that have been made public are I think the right ones. You have, a, you have a curve, you know how a lot of people were getting the infection and uh, more and more and more every day. And then you get to a plateau and the rate of increase in the infected people begins to level off and then it begins to come down. And what um, you know, most governors and have said and most healthcare experts is you want to see that trend coming down for about two weeks and then you can begin to relax some of the social distancing requirements now you know just in the last 48 hours in maryland we because we've made some we've made progress uh they're reducing some of the social distancing so for example recreational fishing where you're out kind of on your own that's okay um, tennis where you have two people on opposite ends of a court so they're looking for some things that can be reopened now but in terms of reopening businesses in maryland uh and certainly schools uh which have now been closed of course till the end of the year they're looking at a little bit more time where the rate of increase in cases coronavirus cases in maryland is going down then reopening as dr wen was saying um, we'll take, well, it may not, it's not going to be just back to normal one day. It's kind of like those light dimmers, right? It's not going to go from, you know, off to full on at once. Um, we're going to have to go back the way we're slowly going back in the United States Senate, uh, where we have in place these uh, rules. Uh, people have to be at least six feet apart. You should wear your mask uh, while you're in the Capitol complex. And as Dr. Wen was saying, um, school, which hopefully you know can start next fall, but it may look very different. Um, it may have those different features that she discussed: different, you know, shifts of students, desks farther apart. So when you ask when we're going to reopen, um, the answer as to when we're going to get back to full-on normal, we really don't know because a lot of experts say that won't really happen until. Um, we have that vaccine uh, and can uh, make sure we vaccinate enough people so that the virus cannot, you know, explode uh, again. Uh, and so we all hope to get to that day as soon as possible. In the meantime, it's going to be these other steps toward opening. And the reason I want to mention again, testing is so important because you hear a lot about testing. And we need to have the capacity not just to test people who have the symptoms, who have the temperature. But we need to be able to do enough testing of, from people who are asymptomatic that we can detect whether they're carrying the virus. So in, in many cases, um, it may be that you know, younger people aren't showing the symptoms. 
but they could be carrying the virus. And if you're carrying the virus and you're back in school, we want to know about it because you could affect other students and they can infect their parents and teachers. So that's why we want to be able to test in real time so we can quickly find if somebody who may not have the symptoms of the coronavirus does have the virus because then we got to make sure that we put them in a, you know, they've got to be in their own place for a little while, we'll provide them with all their needs, but we want to make sure they're not infecting others. So um, getting back to full normal will take a while and getting back to semi-normal will require we put in place these important protections and hopefully wrap up this testing uh, much more quickly. Thank you so much, Senator. And again, thank you to Dr. Wen for responding to all of the thoughtful questions that have come up from youth from across our state. We are so excited that you care about this important topic and hope that we were able to answer some of your questions today. The remainder of our time today is going to be sharing from our program partners who are on the call. Uh, so we have a few youth organizations who are represented and we're gonna pull up a slide uh, so that we can share some resources on how you can stay connected in your community. All right, so we'll go ahead and uh, proceed to our program partner slide. And I believe 4-H is up first. So I'll go ahead and share and then we'll turn it over to our other program partners. So my name again is Dr. Nia Imani Fields. I'm with the University of Maryland Extension 4-H program. Uh, we are uh, a youth organization that serves all of our state, youth uh, five to 18. Uh, we are connected to the University of Maryland and engage in hands-on learning, focusing on healthy living, STEM, and civic engagement. So all of what we've talked about today is also important to us. Uh, we have a website there uh, for learning from home. Uh, so we have hands-on learning opportunities, uh, videos, and interactive lessons that you all can use uh, from your home platforms. And then we have several social media handles that you all can uh, engage in and connect with us that way. We're working on some tech issues, but I will pass it over uh, to Ellie Mitchell if she wants to share some of the opportunities that we have with the Maryland Out of School Time Network. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to thank uh, Senator Van Hollen and Dr. Wen. They were awesome. And uh, I, I have my heart earrings on today just to tell you all that there are so many adults out there that love you and are missing working with you in our programs and our after school programs and our summer uh, programs uh, going forward. Um, I have a few slides. Uh, if, if you don't see them on this deck before we're done, it's okay because you will get all of those or your parents will get them by email. Um, Tomorrow, we're hosting a town hall on um, self-care, taking care of your mental health, and making sure that everything is uh, working well with, um, you, you know, in your house, how you're feeling. Um, some of your parents might be interested in attending that. There's a link to that in the slides that we'll send out. Um, and then we have some fun activities that you can do at home with your family members, some STEM, some arts, uh, um, the Arts Education in Maryland Schools has put together some great resources. Uh, so has um, Kid Museum down in Silver Spring. They have these great Make It activities. Um, so like I said, if we don't see those slides that right now, that's not so important because uh, you will get them. And just know that there are lots of uh, youth development professional adults out there waiting and to connect and support you in any way we can possible. Thanks, Mia. Thank you so much. And we're showing you how to be flexible when tech issues don't always uh, help <laughs> us out. So just know it doesn't happen just to youth, it happens to adults as well. But I'll turn it over to Sadiq Ali with Maryland Mentor if he can talk a little bit about his program. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, again, thank you, Senator Van Hollen, and uh, to your team, uh, Dr. Nia, for helping us to facilitate this, uh, as well as to obviously Dr. Dr. Wynn. And all the young people that, uh, that are present and, again, ask some amazing questions. And I think uh, most, adult, most adults who uh, got those questions will be stumped. So really good job with those questions. That's always the goal, right, is to stump adults when you ask them questions. Uh, never forget that. Uh, but, again, uh, my name is Sadiq Ali, and I serve as executive director for an organization called Maryland Mentor. Uh, and our mission is really all about more and better mentoring opportunities. Um, so all, for, for all the parents on the line that um, are literally serving as parent, chef, uh, teacher, coach, et cetera, uh, I think we can all bear testament to, the, to, to really the power of 
a, a support system and a support network. And that's really what mentoring is all about. As a so the Mentoring Connector is the nation's only national database of mentoring programs. Uh, so essentially, you can uh, hop on the, the Mentoring Connector website. So uh, the web address for the Mentoring Connector is connect.mentoring.org. Um, and essentially, you can pop onto that website, punch your zip code in, and then a list of programs, mentoring programs, uh, will actually populate. Uh, for your area. Um, it's a really, really cool tool because uh, most, most mentoring programs are still active. Uh, we're excited to report just most have gone obviously virtual and online, but there are a number that are both accepting uh, young people into the programs as well as if you all see below that web address, uh, many are still actually recruiting volunteers as well. So if anyone on the line is interested in being a mentor for a young person, we encourage you to visit that web address as well and to make contact with a local program. So uh, again, I'm really just uh, thankful to all of the, uh, the parents on the line for all of the work that, that you all are doing. Again, just juggling a million different things as, as well as to the partners. Feel free to follow us also on, uh, on Instagram. We constantly share out resources and additional trainings, et cetera, for both uh, mentors as well as parents, um, as well as young people. And then our web address, obviously, is MarylandMentor.net, uh, which, again, contains tons of different resources, et cetera. So uh, feel free to reach out. And uh, thank you again for all you do. Thank you. And don't worry if you didn't catch all the websites that we mentioned on the previous slides. We're adding it to the chat, and you'll be sure to get these slides afterwards. So the next group is Boys and Girls Club of America. Here. My name is Chastity Mitchell with Boys and Girls Clubs of America, and I'd just like to thank the Senator for inviting all the out-of-school time providers to be on here in a time when we like to say that now out-of-school time is all the time. Um, so it's what a great opportunity for uh, the youth and the club kids that are here to, to say hello and, and ask you the things that are on their mind. Uh, a few resources that I'd like to share with you from Boys and Girls Clubs of America. Um, first and foremost is myfutures.net, which is a really amazing mobile friendly social platform that has lots of resources um, for families, for youth um, during this time, things from STEM activities to art, physical activity. And it's a great one-stop shop for, for all your time at home right now. Um, there's also a great blog uh, that points to lots of resources. On the next slide, um, I'd like to um, connect you with all of the local Boys and Girls Clubs organizations throughout the state. Um, during traditional times, there are over 41 club sites serving 22,000 youth across the state of Maryland. Um, and right now, uh, all the clubs that you see uh, in front of you are um, offering really unique ways to serve um, kids um, in a different way from things like offering virtual programming all day, every day to uh, serving food um, and also several club sites that are currently still open um, serving families of essential uh, workers right now so we'd love to connect you with the club in your community um, and how we can help in that space um, and then finally uh, the last two slides are just some some great um, tools that we can go through quickly uh, that are just available uh, that are supporting families um, and parents right now from things like helping kids cope uh, to virtual learning lots of good resources that are out there right now that will be shared with you after the call. So thank you again. Thank you. And then our uh, next slide will bring up Jack and Jill. There we are. So Melinda with Jack and Jill. And we're having some trouble hearing you, Melinda. So we can't hear Melinda. We'll see if she's able to figure that out, but I, I will uh, just point you to the resources that she has. Uh, there you are. Oh. No, we're having trouble. So Melinda, if you can type your thoughts in the chat box, we'll be sure for folks to see what you all had to share. Uh, but Jack and Jill is another organization that serves youth across Maryland, uh, and they have lots of resources to share um, on the websites there, looks like some STEM programming and uh, parenting and useful remote learning opportunities. Dr. Fields, uh, we, I got a note from Belinda saying that the host has to unmute her. All right, so it looks like she's unmuted on our end. Melinda, Melinda, this is Brad, I have unmuted you. 
And we're still having some, some technical issues, Melinda. My apologies. I'm not sure why we aren't hearing you on our end. But uh, if you can type some thoughts in the chat, I think that might be helpful for the families that are on. And then they'll be sure to get the resources that we have on the slides uh, for them to access uh, resources from Jack and Jill after the call. Um, but we do want to thank Melinda for joining us from Jack and Jill, who again serves youth across our state and across the country as well. Right, so that brings us to the close of our program uh, sharing time. I do again want to thank all of our program partners who have joined on and you'll see some additional slides coming up here around cultural experiences from Jack and Jill. Uh, so tons of resources that um, will be made available to you all. We are going to email these slides out uh, through the emails that came with the registration and want to thank you. Brad, we can stop sharing and I'll turn it back over uh, to the Senator for any closing remarks you'll like to add. Well, Dr. Fields, thank you so much uh, for hosting us uh, today in terms of um, the online services and what you do at University of Maryland Extension Program and to all the incredible partners, uh, Boys and Girls Club, Jack and Jill, Maryland Mentor, Maryland Out of School Time Network, um, mentioned 4-H, uh, and all of uh, the parents, um, and of course, most of all, all to all of the uh, students uh, who are tuning in, thank you for your amazing questions. Um, you know, those were uh, questions that um, we, 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 those are some tough and, and questions that showed that you're following really closely uh, what's happening. And I, I know all of you are, um, all of us are going through this period that we've never experienced before in our lives and uh, having to cope with it. Uh, so uh, I hope that you will continue to remain engaged. I know your, your parents are looking for ways to uh, keep you fully engaged so that you can continue your learning, um, even as you're uh, not in regular school. And I look forward to the time when you can uh, come back to Capitol Hill. Um, all of you, we'd love to give you a, a field trip and tour and talk to you, but it looks like that will be a little ways off still. Um, and in the meantime, just let us know how we can be of any help to you. I also want to thank members of my office team, uh, Sarah Shenning, uh, who I think is on the line, um, who works on a lot of the education issues with us, uh, but really to everybody who's working so hard uh, during this pandemic to stop the spread, uh, but also uh, to make sure that all of us can be engaged in interesting um, conversations and continue our learning uh, in this environment. So thank all of you who are part of that effort and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation um, in, in person at some point, uh, but if necessary, again, virtually. Thank you all very, very much.